Good evening. It is so good to have you all here. Welcome to Indianapolis. Uh, we have been looking forward to this and being able to be here, fellowshipping with one another and fellowshipping on this topic. Every joint supplies. Well, the water on the good is pink is sticker there. Uh, we here in Indianapolis have been praying and looking to the Lord as we come to this time and as we shared with our brothers James and Kent and the other brothers in preparation. When James first reached out to us, whenever that was, a while ago, about having something here, and he said, talking about the theme being every joint supplying, I was like, that's my heart. And so I, I'm, I was very happy to come right in and take part in that. So I want to share a few opening thoughts as we come into this time. Uh, before I do that, why don't we open our time in prayer? Father, we thank you for the safety that you've provided as people drove. I understand there was a bit of traffic for many, but Lord, you've You've allowed people to get here safely. We thank you for that. We just want to commit this time this weekend to you. Would you accomplish your purpose in our hearts? May we come to see your purpose in the church ever more uh, clearly. May we see our place in the body of Christ, that we would see what you have for, for us your church. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have a thought that I want to share as we get started this weekend. In Ephesians, our theme verse is in Ephesians chapter 4. I'd like to look at some verses before our theme verse, though. Actually, in, in chapter 1, uh, starting at the end of verse 4, In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. As we were singing that song, The Blood of the Passover Lamb, I was reminded of something, and so I just wanted to say as we start out here tonight that the basis of our fellowship and the basis of our coming together as the body of Christ is that we are under the blood of the Lamb. And if we're not under the blood of the Lamb, we cannot enter into this fellowship. And so I, I pray that those of you who are here tonight are under the blood of the Lamb and able to enter in to the fellowship that we, we because the basis of our fellowship in the body and as we talk about the jo every joint supplying is the fact that we, we have been saved by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and that we have been given the Holy Spirit, which is what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, talking about this unity of the spirit in in ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 it says eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit and so at when we're under when we're under the blood of the lamb we are we have the same spirit the spirit of christ and then if we could read a few verses from ephesians chapter 4 uh, starting in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And I'd like to also look at a verse in Colossians. Uh, it's used in a negative sense here, so I want to remove the negative. In the Colossians chapter 2, verse 19, because it's talking about those who tell us not to do things. So it says, and not. I want to just take that and not out of there. And let's just read, it says, Holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. And so we're going to be hearing from brothers and fellowshipping on every joint supplying this weekend, but we have to recognize that everything comes from the head. And I, I was looking into it, I'm not a in any way a doctor, um, but I was looking into this, it this week as I was, I was really thinking about holding fast the head. In our physical body, it is our head that controls our growth. It, it sends out the growth hormones, and we could go into the parts. I don't need to. It is our head that controls the movement. And so if, if every part is not holding fast the head, my I cannot control the movements. And we see, you know, and, and the Lord has allowed some people to have issues where they cannot control their movement or whatever because there's an issue with their brain. And we, we know the Lord has a perfect plan for everyone's life. But that's not ideal. And that really is and not, <laughs> uh, that's not what God is after. God is after us all moving together. It's a result of sin, not sin in the person's life. I don't want to keep going on that. But the idea being, that's not what God is after. He wants us to be able to move. You know, my hand moves, not because my hand decides to move, but because the head says to move. And so as we come, everything else we talk about this weekend in what, where, where, where does God have me in the body? What, what is it that the, you know, this every joint supplying you know even the ability to to do anything and to grow it all comes from the head and we all need to be looking to the head because if we don't look to christ if we're not relying on on him in every step we can't re, uh we can't rightly relate to one another uh, and actually uh our brother need talks about that uh he, he talked about you know we we you know, we need the Lord, and also the Lord needs us, or, you know, Christ needs us. But we need each other, because we each have a measure of Christ. When, when, when we are saved, when we come to him, there's a measure of Christ that without our brothers and sisters, we're missing. We're missing that measure of Christ. And so as we come together, the reason that fellowship can be so sweet is because the measure of Christ in one another Together, we see a fuller picture, and we know that ultimately in the, in the body of Christ, one day we will be together, every member of the body together, and we'll see the whole thing. But even now, we get to see limited, but we get to see more of a fullness through our brothers and sisters, through gifting, through the way that each of us interact with, with each other, through the Lord. Uh, so that's just a thought reminder as we come together that we need to be holding fast the head as we look into what is our gifting. So I think James has thought. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. The Lord's gathered us again, huh? 
and we're grateful to be here. And we're especially encouraged because we really feel like the Lord has something, something significant on his heart for us during this time. You know, we're not here this weekend just to hear some messages. The Lord's brought us here with a bigger purpose. He desires something. He desires we as his people to come into a certain fullness. Because in Christ, there's fullness. And as our brother shared, as we hold fast the head, as those who are now in Christ, joined in Christ, there's a fullness to the body of Christ. There's a breadth. There's a width. There's a height. There's a depth. There's a largeness. The church is not shallow. It's buoyant. It's large. It's glorious. It's a glorious church because we have a glorious Christ. And thankfully, though we would settle for so much less, the Lord refuses to let us settle for something less than the glory to which he's called us. So he's brought us here with purpose. He's brought us here because he wants to recover something. We believe the Lord's in a time of recovery. Ever since those dark ages, much has been recovered. We're thankful for many things that have been recovered in the church. Many of us sit here with something so basic as justification by faith because the Lord recovered that at one point through our brother Martin Luther. And throughout time, the Lord's been recovering and bringing us into greater scene of who he is and who we are as his people. You know, these days, most of us, we know what the church is. Even though we may say, I'm going to church. We know the place we go, that building isn't the church. We know the church isn't just a set of programs. We know the church is that living body of Christ, the called out ones, gathered together unto him. And so we've been burdened these last few years with this matter of the recovery of the practice of the church. Not just seeing what the church is, and we need that. We need a revelation to see what the church is. It'll change our lives. But not only a revelation, we also need a recovery of the experience of it, the practice of it. For all the things that we've been taught, all the things we know, to lay hold of that. And the Lord is the one, by the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, all that's real. And so he's here with us this weekend. God is here with us. The Holy Spirit is here with us. And he wants to lead us into something this weekend. Not just to hear things, but to take hold of things. And we're thankful that we believe the Lord's able to do that. That he's able to bring us in. And so last year we had a conference. It's been a year and a half because summer, winter. But in the winter, I think, of 2022, we gathered in Tallahassee. And the theme that year, some were there, if you remember, was the recovery of the practice of the church or fellowship. Because the practice of the church is really just, as our brother was sharing, it's just sharing, the sharing in God's life. That's what we have in common. That's our fellowship. Our fellowship is Christ. It's his life that we share. And so as we share his life together, which you have in a very basic form, and yet it's all there, you have the experience of the church. Because the substance of the church is Christ himself. And so we had this theme, the recovery of the practice of the church. But as we were preparing before the conference, we had an opportunity for many times of fellowship, some of the brothers. And even throughout the entire weekend, one thing kept coming to us, unity. Do you all remember? Some of them were there. I even think, you know, not only the thread through the messages, but that workshop we had on unity. 
It's like the Lord began to unveil something. He began to really show us his heart for the oneness of the body of Christ. I don't know if you remember, but our brother Daniel Chen, he exhorted us from John 17. And he was saying that the Lord's last will and testament, the last thing that he spoke before he went to the cross, that we might be one as him and the Father are one. And he, he prayed that prayer three times in that chapter. Three times he says that they may be one, even as you, Father, and I are one. And our brother alluded to the fact that it's usually in those last moments before someone passes on, that's the moment where they share that thing that's the most important to them. The most important thing is shared in that moment. Why? Why is this so important, this matter of unity? Brothers and sisters, I will say this. I wonder, without us really laying hold of this, in reality, a oneness of spirit with our brothers and sisters, if the church can be built. It's important because it's the foundation from which the church experienced the experience of Christ in the midst comes forth. Because how can we really be built together? How can the church be built if we're not together? And not just with those perhaps who are like-minded, not just with those who are like us. Because whether we realize it or not, we need one another, everyone. And not just those who think the way we do. We need every member of the body of Christ, those within our current sphere, those we're meeting with, and, and likely, more than likely, those who don't meet with us right now, we need our brothers and sisters. I, I think sometimes we, a, a wrong thought has slipped into our minds and we've lost sight of this. We don't see how much we need every member of the body of Christ. Now a question from Ephesians chapter 4 where it says the body is held together by that which every joint supplies. I'll question that later. But can the body be held together without every joint? So we had that theme on unity, and now it makes more sense. And even if you look at the scriptures, the first three chapters of Ephesians really get into that objective truth of the church. But when you get into chapter 4 through 6, you start to get into the experience. And what does it start there? Let's go ahead and read it. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read these first few verses. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness. This is one way we walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which we've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, of all who is over all and through all and in all. One body. And so we're encouraged here with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love and being diligent to preserve this unity that we have in the spirit. So leaning on to that, as it goes into verse 7, which is our theme passage, 7 through 16 for this weekend, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And I want to focus there on that last part. So that he might fill 
all things. Now this is God's purpose, that Christ would fill all things. You know, that's really how the church is built. How is it built? Now, I just moved into construction. Just built uh, Morgan's Lanai last week, right? Is it built with hammer and nails? No. How is the church built? What has to happen? There has to be an increase of Christ. And the reason is, is because at the very substance of the church, the, the very substance of it, is Christ himself. He is the fabric. He is the substance of the church. Without Christ, without an increasing of Christ, really, what's happening? Have you ever thought about that in your life? You know, sometimes I think about that. I'm like, where am I at in the Lord? If Christ isn't increasing in me, I could be doing whatever I'm doing, and nothing's really happening. This is God's purpose, that he would fill all things that all things would be summed up in Christ. And so I think the question comes to this, how does this happen practically? And I think it's here in these verses in 7 through 11, that Christ would fill all things, that Christ would be glorified amongst us. You know, this matter of Christ filling all things I remember when I first saw it, it just changed my life because I used to think that the way the church was built or the way that I would grow as a believer is I would, would kind of climb like a, like a spiritual ladder, right? And I know I've shared this before, so for those who've heard it, I thought that, you know, if I get a little spiritual, maybe I would open a breaking bread meeting. And if I got a little more spiritual, then maybe... You open up like a prayer time. And then the height of spirituality is preaching from the pulpit. Now, where does that come from? It's because sometimes it's what we see. We think like, this is it. Now, if that's all the church is, that's disappointing. If it's just some outward form of things, if it's just kind of like how we run our meetings, if that's the church, now think about it. It talks about in the scripture, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, that the church is Christ. Now, I'm not saying we take on the deity of, of God. But fundamentally, when you look at those verses, what it's saying is that though we're many members, one body, which is the Christ. Can you imagine if... I don't really know where how to express this or, or where I'm going with this, but that... If, if the church, if Christ was just a set of meetings and a set of forms and a set of things like that, now we know that the Lord is so much bigger than that. And so if we're the body of Christ and we're to express the fullness of Christ, we know the church is so much larger, so much more vast than these things. And when we see it, it can be life-changing, but not only to see it, also to experience it. You know, recently, after we left the gathering last year, we had um, that theme on unity, came back to Port Charlotte, and a few months later, the Lord began to gather together some brothers and sisters from seven different church groups in town, a pretty wide range of backgrounds, from ultra-conservative, the gift have ceased, to ultra-Pentecostal, it's all about the experience and everything in between, right? And the Lord gathered us together by his doing. And I really don't know what to say about it, except for it's special. It's been a very special thing. And I think those of us who are meeting together, we know, like, this is special. And sometimes we may not know why. Why is it special? But you know why it's special? Because Christ is there. When we gather in his name, he's there in the midst and what we're tasting, it's like no one's so special, but what we taste is we taste a bit of the glory of God because he's there. And this, this reality, when we touch it, it starts to ruin us. We start to question things. We start to wonder. And we start to 
long for something more of what God has for us as his people. You know, in those times, there's just the sweetness of just brethren dwelling together in unity. And it has been a wonderful experience. You know, but for something like this, when you really see something like this, when you begin to taste something like this, what you start to say is, it's worth giving your life for. When we really touch into church life in a fuller way, you say it's worth giving your life for. It's no different than when you touch Christ in a living way. We sang that song, Knowing You, Jesus. But when you're knowing the Lord, you say it's worth anything. No cost is too great. You say it's worth giving my life for. And you know that's what it costs. Do we want to see the church built do we want to see recovery, brothers and sisters? It will cost us everything. In the scripture in Matthew, Matthew 6, verse 16, verse 24. Let's turn there for a moment. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, we always focus on the negative part, but you know what's been sticking out to me in those verses? You'll find it. What will you find? You'll find life. If we lose our lives, we'll find what real life is. If we lose our lives together, we'll find what real life is together. Oh, there is something wonderful the Lord has in store for us, his people. There is nothing like it. Brethren, dwelling together in unity, sharing in the life of God. If our thought of the church is drabness, what a disappointment. It is nothing like that. Sometimes it's like that because we haven't lost our lives. We're still holding on. But you can't have both. You can't have your life and his life. It's one or the other. Now Christ came and he died so that we might be delivered from ourselves, from our old life, and we might have new life. Sometimes we can be a little confused or deceived, but there is nothing better than the life of God. He came that we might have life and life to the full. And when we begin to taste a little of it, have you ever had this experience? When you're in that place, you're clean, you're consecrated, you're just abiding with the Lord, you're sharing in his heart. Have you ever had that experience like, Lord, what, whatever it is, don't let me lose this spot. It's so good to be with you. You don't care that you've given up your life. You know, this is where I want to remain. And so we're encouraged in order to gain it, we have to lose it. And what does that really mean? It means we need to, probably most of you could finish my sentence, right? What are you thinking? Present ourselves as a living sacrifice, like it talks about in Romans chapter 12. Now, this is our spiritual service of worship. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We present our whole beings to the Lord. Now, what happens when we present ourselves to the Lord? His life can flow in us. We give ourselves up. You know, when you think of a sacrifice, they're giving themselves up and saying, Lord, I'm allowing you to take residence. You know, the Lord does desire that in a very real way. The Lord wants a body. He wants to live on this earth. And the way he does that is through you and me and all the children of God he does it when we present ourselves to him. He's able to have a body, like our brother was saying, we're holding fast the head, and we're not all doing whatever, but Christ is doing what he wants to do. And everything the Lord does is beautiful. Everything the Lord does is wonderful. But he needs a few, some,
who are willing to present themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and blameless, to present ourselves fully to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I belong to you. We belong to the Lord. He's bought us with his precious blood. And it's good to belong to the Lord. There's no better place to be than fully given up. That's where there's life. That's what the scripture says. Do you believe it? It says if you lose your life, you'll find it. Do you believe that? If you don't, let's pray right now. I don't need to go on. Lord, remove the blinders. Because he is the center of life. The source of life. God, please have mercy. Cause us to see this. That we would let go. What are we holding on to? And we need the Lord. I know it. I know it in my own life. Only he can help us. Sometimes we hold things so dear. There's one thing I've been holding dear for so long. And it's only by the grace of God. Such a simple thing. But I'll hold that thing. And it'll keep me from having the power and the life and the fullness that I ought to. Sometimes just the smallest things. Are we willing to let those things go? You know, with the Lord, there's no holding back. If we want to walk with him, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we want to really have fellowship with the Lord and with one another, we have to walk in the light, which means we can't hide anything. If the Lord touches something in our life, nothing's off the table. It's just, yes, Lord. And what we find there as we let go, and I know I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize it. It's naturally hard for us to let go. But when we let go, oh man, on the other side, on the other side of the cross is resurrection life and resurrection power. You know why the church is weak? Because we're all holding on to our own lives. And Christ is not able to reign in his people. He's not free to reign in us. But if he reigns in us and his life flows in us, we'll find there is spirit, there is power, there is the gifts the manifestations for the building up of the body of Christ, everything that's needed. Sometimes we don't know what our gift is, our spot is, because that life hasn't been able to mature. It's no different than natural life. I saw a little video of my, my new nephew, Jasper, just a little guy's trying to eat melon, trying to pick this thing up, gets it, and it's just about got in there, and it squirts out of his hand, right? And he goes at it again, and he's kind of eating that thing, but... It's ugly. I mean, he's not doing it well. You know what I'm saying? Not it's ugly, it's cute, but he's not doing it well. But that's because he's just a little baby. But as he grows up, I mean, now I'm pretty good. If I want a piece of melon, I can really go at that thing. I can probably go at it too fast, okay? Why? Because I've grown up. I now can use my hands and my, my eyes, especially my eyes. Now, my kids... I don't know if your kids are this way, but my kids, I say, hey, can you guys pick up the room? There's something wrong with their eyes. <laughs> now, I used to think they, they just were like lazy, but now I am convinced. It must not be till you're like 15, 16, 20. I don't know when you get to the right age, but you can actually see everything on the floor. Because <laughs> I'm like, what about that? I mean, I'll count 20 things that they did not pick up. But as you mature and become an adult, when you walk in the room, you're like, look, I see it. I see these things. And so this is how it is with spiritual life. As we grow up, as the life of God increases within us, those giftings, like a spiritual discernment, being able to discern something that's not outwardly obvious, Someone's struggling with something, something's going on, you can discern it. You're able to pray for that person, that's a gift, the gift of discernment. That gift starts to manifest itself, and all of a sudden you're sensing things, and it's not in your mind, you're sensing in the spirit, and God's giving you that discernment for a reason. And as you exercise that, 
you find that it brings life and fullness to the body of Christ. This is how the body is built up. Now, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, later on, it says, like, we're growing up into the fullness of the stature which belongs to Christ. We're growing up into Christ as the head. We're growing up in that fullness. We're coming into that largeness. Now, can you imagine if all the gifts in the body were activated? Would there be any need amongst us? Surely we would say, just like in Acts, there's no need amongst us. There's no lack. Tonight, are you lacking in some way? Do you feel there's some need amongst you? Perhaps. Now, of course, the Lord can meet that need. But the way he meets that need is through the body. This is his way. But it requires us to give ourselves. You know, this is love. This is a love to the Lord, but it's a love for one another. If I really love you, I don't just give you a hug and say, I love you. I offer myself to the Lord. I offer myself to him. So that whatever gift I have, I'm able to employ it. Not for myself. Not for, not for me, but for the body of Christ, that it might be built. And so the Lord wants to encourage us tonight in this way of offering ourselves. Now, I'm not sure to go into this or not, but I want to talk about one other aspect of offering ourselves. And I call it specific consecration. Now, there's a general consecration and a specific. And then the teachers will get up and they'll correct me later if my doctrine's wrong, but I'm just fellowshipping here a little. And I'm going to call this specific consecration. It's the type of consecration where as the Lord puts his fingers on things in your life, you offer it very specifically to him. When we got together, a few of us brothers, we met in Emporia back in April, May of last year. And we were there, we were just there to seek the Lord about some things. And it did not turn out it all as we expected. A lot of the stuff we thought we were going to get into, we didn't, at least until the last night when they kept us up till 4 a.m. But the, what the Lord really spoke to us about were these little things in our lives that he's, get, he's shined his light on and that we have not specifically offered up to him. And we felt that's what he was asking us to do. And what we recognize is like, if we're getting ready for a time like this and you're going to be preaching, what do you do? You consecrate yourself because you're like, wow, if I'm going to have to share the Lord's word, I need to be like right with the Lord, right? But then what happens in between the conferences or some other thing, some other area of response? Oh, I preached. I'm not preaching for three weeks. Let me put my hair down. Now I can just be carnal. But I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like how it works. But imagine if like, no, we just like stay consecrated. And these things that the Lord's spoken to us about, if we bring them specifically to the Lord and we offer them. And so by God's grace, we did that with some things. And all I know is I left there so much more full. I felt like I remember actually from days past, I was like, oh yeah, I remember. I used to live like this, like knowing God's will. Like it says in Ephesians chapter four, that we're to know his will. Not always guessing at his will, not always unclear, but knowing the will of God full of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just say some people should know his will and some people should be full of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is our birthright to know God's will and to be full of the Holy Spirit, singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to God. Isn't that it? When you're in that place, just abiding with the Lord, just worshiping the Lord, that praying at all times without ceasing, just naturally flowing out of you. That's what the Lord's called us to. So this way, if the Lord gives us something specific to go through and to offer those things to the Lord is something that is a little bit of a deeper call that he may be calling us to. And just one last point for this evening. You know, this is really not for when we leave. This is right here, right now. I mentioned this earlier, but the Lord didn't bring us here just to, like, hear some messages. He brought us here to be a joint of supply. That's why you're here, at least in part. You have your gift. You have your function right here, right now, this moment. Some probably already have been functioning. But for this whole weekend together, what the Lord's wanting right now is for us to step into that. 
to consecrate ourselves and to step in. Lord, this weekend, what's my spot? How can I function? And it's not just going to be like in sharing times. You know, a lot of times we just think of these verbal gifts. How is the gift of mercy exercised? I love to bring that one up. I think it's a wonderful gift. Am I, you know, I, someone, I, I think I know maybe someone who has that gift of mercy. When you see it, when you see the way they're merciful towards someone, you just kind of learn mercy. Kind of how we learn things, even seeing the exercising of those gifts. So right here this weekend, the Lord wants to encourage us to be that joint of supply. So I was going to go into some other things, but I think perhaps we'll just end here. And let's just commit this to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just come to you tonight. We just want to thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are with us, that you're for us. We thank you, Lord. You're the powerhouse by which we're able to come in and lay hold of this life to which you've called us, even to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which we've been called. We thank you, Lord. It's not by strength nor by might, but by your spirit. And Lord, how we do lean on you. Lord, when we hear these things, we say, it's impossible with man. How can we do it? We can't let go of the smallest thing. But what, Lord, we just know as, as we look to you even here together tonight, and we do tonight, right now, Lord, we look to you. We just look to you and ask for your help, that you would help us. Help us to respond to your encouragement. Help us to offer ourselves to you. Show us, Lord, those things that are holding us back, that those things that are, we're holding on to where we're preserving our lives. Lord, grant us to come into true life. And not just as individuals, but life together as the body. Grant us, Lord, we believe you're doing this in a much larger way throughout this whole earth. But Lord, grant us to have some part in it. To lay hold of, of the fullness of life together. We just thank you, Lord, for what you prepared for this time. We do bless you. Just tell you, Lord, that we love you and we're grateful. We're grateful for you, Lord. We're grateful for one another and we're grateful to be here. In Jesus' name, amen.